And here I was with the, in the focal position of the God figures and the patients I mean, uh, uh, offering me the, their votives and my assistance. But very soon I found out that in this business you need group work. And the patients here, these two patients, are part of the whole group work. And I have the assistants, the Dr. Kana here, the chemist, the nurses, and the dietitians, the technicians, the administrators. So you, have, you need the whole teamwork. And I think that peritoneal dialysis was one of the first treatments that introduced the concept of equal terms. The nurses now are equal to the physicians uh, in terms of the contribution to the care. And I want to pay a credit of these particular nurses, my first head nurse, my second head nurse, and my current head nurse, and uh, my, our secretary and uh, a nurse educator. I think that uh, the, I may be presenting here by myself, but I think that uh, the, I, they, they, they get as much credit as I, as I get. Very soon, there were so many people visiting our unit to find out what are we doing, more than 700 people, and after I was keeping a list of their names, so I said, why don't we produce some brochure to keep them informed of the progress of the peritoneal dialysis? And we started in 1981, 1979, what is there, 91, this peritoneal dialysis bulletin, four pages, very soon became a little magazine, with the assistance of Baxter, we were sent in, uh, distributing that to 30, 13 or 14,000 people around the world, free of charge. Uh, around that, I think that the, the concept came, we have so much interest, why don't we create <coughs> an international society for peritoneal dialysis? And this journal became now the official journal of the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis with the name Peritoneal Dialysis International. And now it's now the a prominent journal among the medical uh, uh, journals. And if you look here what happened around the world over the years because of all these efforts, not only my efforts and all the colleagues and all the peritoneal dialysis community, uh, you see 1983 to 2001, there were over 140,000 patients uh, around the world in 2001. And I would say by now around 15% of the world's dialysis population are treated by peritoneal dialysis. What are the advantages of peritoneal dialysis? At least uh, most of the people were saying in terms of survival, the first few years, couple of years, the survival of patients on peritoneal dialysis is better than hemodialysis. This is from Canadian data. I think similar results have been produced by American data. After two or three years, when the residual kidney function disappears, they become the same. And perhaps after three, four years, the results may be worse. So peritoneal dialysis for the first five years may give initially better and equal results in terms of survival. Uh, the, how long the patients can stay on peritoneal dialysis? The present, the current dialysis solutions still contain glucose degradation products, toxic products that produce during the sterilization process. So the peritoneal membrane that was not made for peritoneal dialysis is thickened and is damaged, loses the capacity to ultrafilter. So m not many patients stay on peritoneal dialysis for more, longer than 10 years. But at least these patients have stayed on peritoneal dialysis for 23 years. So there is hope that can, if one membrane has survived so long, other membranes can survive. And I think that uh, the other thing is that we want to keep patients long term and in good quality of life. And this is one of the studies that measured the quality, compared quality of life of patients on peritoneal dialysis, this curve with hemodialysis, with the various kind of questionnaires, the vitality, the activity, social function, etc. And you see that in all of them, the quality of life of patients peritoneal was a little better, although not statistically significant, except this question of body pain. So what we can say that the quality of life of patients on peritoneal dialysis is the same or in some areas a little better than patients on hemodialysis. What about cost? At least in some countries, the cost of peritoneal dialysis is much lower than cost of hemodialysis. Here is a United, United States registry. The annual cost, this is in US dollars, 1998, I think. It was 54,755 per patient per year, hemodialysis, 47,000. If you look at this Canadian, four centers, the annual cost of uh, hemodialysis, 54,900, 
31,000 COPD. Grossly, you can say for every two patients on hemodialysis, you can treat three patients on COPD. And nowadays, when costs are very critical factors, that's very important. Look at the difference in, in France, $72,000 for hemodialysis per year versus 38, mainly because they are offering free taxes for the patients to come and go uh, from their units. So are there areas that peritoneal dialysis the next five, 10 years need? Yes, they need. We need to, to, have a perito to, to treat the peritonitis still unpredictable and they're severe. They, we decrease the rate of peritonitis, but the severe peritonitis, that is pseudomonas, staph aureus, and fungal peritonitis are still with us and occasional are fatal. We don't know how to treat them well. We need to improve there. We need to do daily exchanges with night dialysis. We need the, the, uh, uh, the catheters sticking out of the catheter. For young people, some women, creates body image concerns. We have to address them. Uh, of, we still lose more patients. After three, four years, many patients without dying, they cannot continue on peritoneal dialysis, go to hemodialysis. More patients go from peritoneal to hemo than from hemo to peritoneal. So we have to address this technique failure. As I said, we need the long-term peritoneal uh, changes that to, uh, avo how to avoid ultrafiltration failure and how to avoid this dreadful complication that's called encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. That is a fatal condition, is, has reported in large numbers in Japan, and I think that's related to the bio-incompatibility of the present solutions and also the malnutrition. But I think that there is there is some hope that these things will be addressed because uh, among the milestones of the history of peritoneal dialysis, I consider the fact that we have now, the last five, 10 years, we have identified the factors responsible for chronic peritoneal damage. This is the hyperosmolality, the acidity, the lactate, the glucose, but more above the glucose degradation product. And the industry has responded and have come, gave us new solutions that have neutral pH and have very low concentrations of glucose degradation products. So we have new solutions. We have the aquadexin solution that improves ultrafiltration. We have neutral pH with the low glucose degradation product solutions. Physioneal is one produced by Baxter. We have the amino acid solutions. There's glycerol solutions. And there may be some other solutions coming. So I'm very optimistic that the next few uh, years, there will be some proof that these solutions can be effective over long term and the peritoneal damage will be uh, uh, avoided and that the patients will be able to stay long term. When they ask nephrologists, uh, both in the United States and Canada, what do you think is the place of peritoneal dialysis? It's interesting, even though the place is lower now, there are Prediction was that if you don't concern about money and you concern only about survival, uh, quality of living, and wellness, they said that 33% of the patients should be on uh, home peritoneal dialysis and 12% should be on hemodialysis. And actually, if cost becomes also a factor, that uh, even more, 40% be, should be, more, more, more patients should go on home dialysis. I believe that this is the right place of peritoneal dialysis. And I'm optimistic that uh, with the new solutions and with the new understanding, with more sciences, the new generation of pioneers in peritoneal dialysis will be able to make this prediction reality. Thank you.